So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, it is December 3rd, 2014. And um, we are here to follow up on um, some conversations we've been having here and there um, back in August and September. Certainly we had a couple and, and there have been others going on. Um, and around Ferguson, uh, defining what the issue is is part of what I think we should be doing, but certainly um, we want to be doing that. Um, is that Jane? Hey, Paul. Uh, Jane Higgins, welcome. Um, so we, we are gathering here to have a conversation about police violence, about, um, well, to borrow the subtitle of, Renee, your article, it's um, the killing of black men, um, and that's certainly an issue here too, but certainly there are a lot of issues. Here in New York City, there was just another indictment that uh, did not happen, so Eric Garner is um, on a lot of our minds, and perhaps yours too. Um, but I, I want to just kind of start with introductions, um, if we can. Renee, would you start us off? Um, and I've, I kind of want to, uh, you and I talked about beginning this with you're talking about your article um, mm -hmm. that has been really published online, but will be published in um, Rethinking Schools. Yes. Um, would, would you mind introducing yourself and then um, just say hello, and then we'll go around and hear Hi. from other people. Um, Hi, so welcome. I'm Renee. Thank you. Thank you for having me, too. Um, very honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, so I am a, a teaching artist. I teach poetry and sometimes theater. and um, I also do teacher training, so that's kind of the perspective I'm coming from, is how do we get teachers feeling comfortable to talk about heavy topics in the classroom, and then how do we, you know, create safe space and all of that. So the article that you're referring to is um, titled, Happening Yesterday, Happened Tomorrow, and it's a, um, a line that I borrowed from a poem about Henry Dumas, um, written by Addis Elise Germain, and I used that poem, pairing it with a poem by Willie Perdomo. Um, which was a poem to honor the life of Amadou Diallo. So these two poems, I've been in conversation with each other in my classroom um, when we processed the, the murder of Sean Bell and then Trayvon Martin. And so it's just been a lesson that I've continued to go back to and kind of tweak and change as so many more um, murders keep happening. Um, so this article will be out in the winter edition of Rethinking Schools, and it just kind of outlines the different steps that I took to have um, safe conversation, but also to have, help young people create art in response to the injustice and to kind of help them express their voice and what they want to say about what's going on in their world. Very cool. Welcome. And, and you work at Dream Yard. Is yes, that I work at Dream by? Yard. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Jane, do you want to introduce yourself? We'll just come around here. Sure. Um, I'm Jane Higgins. I work with the New York City Writing Project with Paul. Um, we work with New York City public school teachers, um, providing PD through workshops and side-by-side -side in classrooms. Welcome. I think it's your first time on. Or maybe maybe not quite. The first time I've, I've been able to join and get in. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Janae Williams. Introduce yourself if you will. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Janae Williams. I am a teacher at uh, sorry at Colonial Forge High School in Stafford, Virginia, um, where I am the gifted resource teacher as well as the service learning coordinator for the school. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Cool. And Chris, Christopher. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Christopher. Yeah. Yeah, let's go with Christopher first. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. I'm Chris Rogers. I work at Green Street Friends School. Uh, it's a local, in, it's an independent school uh, inside Philadelphia. And um, yeah, we're just doing introductions, so. <laughs> Happy to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, and, and by the way, the links to everything that people are talking about um, will be available, are available at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. And Chris Sloan is kind of keeping track of all of the things that are going, over, going on there over there. But introduce yourself, if you would, Chris. 
Yeah, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach uh, high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And you just wrote a blog post, and, and I, there were, we invited a couple of uh, newish teachers, if you're still trying to get in, please keep trying, um, who asked really provocative questions like, how do I teach about Ferguson? What do I do? And you had some answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to mention some of the things, some of the projects you're involved with that... Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned so, it in that post. Yeah, yeah so... Um, I work with um, KQED Do Now, which is KQED is a, a media outlet in the Bay Area, and um, they have been having conversations with students across the country uh, about you know Ferguson since the summer, and um, so my students have kind of been monitoring that, and they put together uh, a summary of responses from students from around the country there, and then I have another student who's um, putting together um, some videos where he's going to our local police and interviewing them about what kind of response are they having and, and you know, what are they doing about it is his angle. Um, and so I can talk about that a little bit later. And that's in association with um, PBS NewsHour. My students are members of the um, student reporting labs there. So, yeah. So we're here to kind of learn from each other and um, figure things out. Uh, I did mention it already, but uh, does somebody want to take on your response to, you know, the Eric Garner non-indictment and um, how you're feeling about it? Do you want to start there, and then we can broaden out from there? I, I, I mean, let me just direct it to you, Renee. I, I, I mean, it's kind of profound that you're doing the same lesson over and over again with different incidents, right? Um, right. So it's, it's not kind of profound. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's it's actually heartbreaking. It's really hard for me to um, actually have this conversation tonight. I, was, I spent the day with elementary students um, sharing poetry and working with them, um, and I didn't know what was going on. I walked out, and after I got out of that session I heard the news and it was such a this strange moment of being in a classroom with young people very young people like third graders and they're just so excited to be getting these picture books and we're talking about the Harlem Renaissance and um, and then I come outside and I learn about this this non-indictment and I'm just reminded of the gravity of what we do like you know yeah, I'm kind of stunned, actually. It took me a moment to get myself together to even have this conversation tonight because I think, you know, we sit around and, and have all these theories and we have discussions and we talk a lot, um, but it's just very real. It's a very real moment right now for me in my personal life and in the classroom of what's going on and how relevant it is to be teaching and talking about social justice. I, I think that's, um, if I could just jump in, Paul. Go ahead. Um, it's like one of the, um, like when you talk about like being it, being it personally relevant and also educationally relevant, um, that's been a, a big thing for me. I'm the only black male at my little independent school. Um, we have a, you know, a smattering of um, students of color um, with a percentage of those being um, black students. And the, the sad thing for me or the thing that I, the burden that I live with is that when Eric Gardner goes, when the when the murder of Eric Gardner goes unindicted, mm -hmm. I'm the only person in my building who's like seeing this timeline on Twitter and outraged. You know, everybody else is like, is this is a regular uh, Wednesday, and I'm like, and so the um, I was talking with a colleague about this today too. Is like the even the responsibility of outrage is mm -hmm. on me to convince other people of why they should be outraged at something that is of, that I, I believe affects us as a nation. But um, like as my colleague was telling me, um, what, what am I supposed to do? And so it's like when, when these type of incidents happen, the, the look becomes towards me because I'm the one who's out here 
having these conversations, you know, and really well, working with the Philadelphia community and Philadelphia organizations around, well, how do we talk about this? How do we make this relevant in classrooms? But the, even that responsibility of the outrage, like no one checked in on me and said, you know, Eric Garner didn't, uh, his, his, the, I don't even know his name. That's another sad part. That's a whole different story. I only know Eric Garner's name. I don't know the cop's name. But mm. the, that, <laughs> um, that, that to me was like a double, a double smack in the face of like no one even knows the pain that I, I walk through this building with on a daily basis. And I don't and I don't want to be the one that has to go around telling them just so they can sold me about it. Like I'm I'm good. Yeah, I mean I think that's really an important point to bring up and I think that's why it's important to for everyone to own this, right? So it's not about it should not be up to the people of color to be talking about police brutality. Um, it really should be, because it's a current event. We're talking about a current event that has a historical context, right? So if we are doing our jobs as educators and having young people be critical of their world and look out into the world and talk about what's happening, I'm, I don't understand how you don't have this conversation. In a class that's all white, in the class that is, um, you know, full of students of color, I feel like this conversation should be happening across America, regardless of of where you live and what the student population and demographics are. So I think that's a very good point. Um, yeah. Janae, you were shaking your head at different points there. I, I mean, Renee and Chris perfectly um, articulated my feelings. Um, but I'm still going to talk. Um, <laughs> uh, since, you know, last Monday, uh, Tuesday being the last day of school is such a reprieve for me. Um, just mm -hmm. a moment to be able to breathe and know that I don't have to carry this mask with me about the, the, the pain that I had over the non-indictment of um, Darren Wilson last week. Um, so... I have not talked to any of my colleagues. Um, by the way, my school um, is primarily white, primarily white affluent uh, students. The population reflects that. The, the teacher population reflects that as well. Um, and they're in the past, so I'm a second year teacher. In the past, um, and so last year, um, there have been times when, you know, conversations have come up regarding race and, and things of that nature um, where, you know, I just realized, hmm, this is not quite the place I want to be right now. Um, these opinions are not reflective of any of the truths that I know to be truths. Um, so I just need to remove myself from the situation. Um, and I think that that has been uh, one of the things that I've had to uh, kind of deal with over this last week between Eric Gardner and um, and Mike Brown um, right now trying to figure out how, because we know, right, the, the most important thing right now as educators is the difficult conversation that we have to have. Um, but how do we start that? Specifically as, as a black woman, how do I start that as the one black voice? Because once you open that can, <laughs> you have to be Wikipedia, you have to be... <laughs> Every encyclopedia, you have to be all of it. Um, you can't just open it up and not have some answers and, you know, have your opinion. You can't do that. Um, so just, just trying to figure out what that space um, is going to look like, but also thinking about self-care and what that also look, how that plays into um, uh, beginning that dialogue. Um, so, yeah, I, I still haven't taken any time today to, you know, fully sit and, and let it sink in. When the news came across, because I have AP um, Associated Press on my, on my phone, uh, my heart just sunk, and I was at track practice. So I was with my kids. You know, they were really excited about life, completely oblivious to the world around them. Um, and, it, you know, when you think about, you know, that juxtaposition of, of the reality that you – are living every day and, and your kids and how amazing they are and excited they are. Um, it, it's just unreal. Um, it's like you're, you're living in two worlds at one time. It's very unreal. So yeah, that, those are just my thought right now. That's right now. I haven't had time to think and process um, this non-indictment. So 
Oh. Yeah, and that was um, one of the things that it was actually a former student of mine. I taught her, you know, a long time ago, like maybe 20 years ago. She's an educator now, and she wrote like, "How's everybody dealing with, uh, you know, Ferguson?" It was uh, she posted it just, you know, right the day of uh, the announcement, and um, you know, my response was, you know, we've been looping back to it all year. And um, so like the first day of class in my school, and we're predominantly, this class that I'm thinking of right now, um, we're predominantly white, um, but you know, it was the first day of school and it was right after, you know, Ferguson. And um, I did the, fir the normal first day of school stuff like, you know, here's the syllabus, hey everybody, you know, let's all get along and that kind of stuff. And uh, this, uh, at the end of class, uh, a Hispanic student walked up to me and you know he's he's not really uh, really outspoken or anything and he said hey have you been keeping up on what's going on in Missouri and and I thought it really struck me it's like you know I had prioritized the stuff that was so important and a student came up to me and said have you been keeping up on this and so he's consequently he's kind of taken up this this uh, story about you know like um, pressing our local law enforcement on you know what what are they doing about it? Like, what proactive things are they trying to do to to address this in the future? So, like her question, "What are you doing about Ferguson?" My answer was, "Well, her question was, what are you doing about Ferguson today?" And my question was, "Well, what have we been doing, and what are we going to keep doing, talking about from now on?" Because really, you know, like my students are like maybe a lot of yours. Uh, in a bubble and they'd rather not a lot of times think about these things and talk about these things uh, and so you know it's really important to bring these things into the classroom and once we do then interesting good things happen yeah I'm, oh, I, 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 I was just gonna ask um, to slow down a little bit on the question of um, there was a mention of the difficult conversation, but at that point I wasn't clear on who that was with. Is that with our colleagues or is it with students? Yeah. Or well, both? But yeah. Go ahead, Janae. For, for me, um, it's just initiating that conversation with colleagues. Um, with students, um, I think I'm just looking more for ways to, to keep it um, you know, a continuous thread throughout um, our year, um, but but more the difficult conversation and idea was more um, <laughs> talking <laughs> with colleagues. It's okay, Chris is having some fun there. But that's oh, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm up a storm. I'm sorry. No I'm problem. Janae was I'm saying that you're trying to keep it up as a continuous conversation throughout the year. Janae, yes. did you want to keep saying, talking, or, or um, were you finished? Yeah. Uh, really? So. No, I'll, I'll develop that later, because that, <laughs> that was really it. <laughs> that's all I had right there. I, but I think that's a good point, though, about thinking about not just teaching about Ferguson, right? But the, mm -hmm. for me, I'm trying to think about how do I bring my... This, my um, students' lives into the classroom on a continuous basis? And how do I make space for them to process what's happening in the world? So it's Ferguson right now. What will it be next year? We don't know. Um, you know, years a couple years ago when it was Hurricane Katrina, that was another thing we were talking about. So just thinking about how do you set up space in your class to invite students to have ownership of what you're, you're talking about, whether it's just a few minutes at the end or beginning to go over current events or just have open forum or how can you use, you know, curriculum to also teach it. I think I'm always trying to think about making it relevant to what's happening um, and then trying to provide some context about root causes so that young people aren't feeling like this is out of the blue and this is so random or it's just about their city, their town, but that there's connections and reasons and systems of why these things are happening, you know. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. 
Yeah, just to mention, Renee, um, the, the, you mentioned the Harlem Renaissance earlier, and you just r mentioned um, Katrina. And, I mean, your books about those things for kids are, are quite wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so, <to say>. um, <laughs> so, you know, after this is done, go Google Renee Watson, and you can find those. Um, but, but you've had – part of that interest seems to be about dealing – having a curriculum that is um, – that addresses trauma, um, is that fair to say? I mean, and is For it about me? root causes? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say a curriculum that addresses trauma. I mean, I think by nature of, of some of the populations I work with, trauma is definitely something that our young people are dealing with and coping with. But, I, again, I think it's just about making a curriculum that is, relevant and alive and present. So not stale and just, you know, rooted in, for me, because I teach a lot of writing, so thinking about not just teaching the classics, but who else am I bringing in that's contemporary to pair with those people so that there's a connection with young people and that they can then write their own stories and put their own spin on things. And constantly trying to get them to look outside of themselves um, but also then thinking about once you're looking out into the world, how does this affect you personally in your world? So I just think it's more about a student-centered curriculum, um, but definitely with the social justice lens of critiquing the world, celebrating marginalized groups, um, et cetera. Yeah. And um, I would just want just to hop in. Um, I know one, one of the things that happened today at my school is uh, one of the um, – sort of like leaders of the school, uh, she came up to me about they're doing a, um, they do an independent study with the eighth grade in the spring, and they want to do it, uh, she's like a service-based thing, and this year they want to make it about social media and social justice. Mm -hmm. So she, um, knowing sort of like the conversation I like to have and things I like to do, she said, would you want to be a part of it? And um, my thing, it kind of fit, it, it kind of fit in with um, sort of like where I'm at with the students as well. It's just like, well, if I'm going to be a part of this class, ain't nobody going to be safe in this class. This is not going to be a safe space um, where we talk about comfortable things, where everybody's feel all right. We're going to really get to investigate some issues, you know, and we're going to have to take it there to that level. And so, like, as much as you want me to be a part of this class, um, that, like, my inner dialogue is like, if you really want me to be a part of this class, that's where it has to go. And I don't think that we're going to be able to get to a, like, product uh, or a, um, a little event where we can take pictures. I don't think it's going to get there. We're going to end up having some deep conversations about our own privilege, our own biases, and have to deal with that. And for me, that's, that's where I'm at with the students. Um, I kind of do it in sneaky ways. You know, sometimes people, uh, a lot of students say I'm funny. Um, but, like, today... Some students are walking by, the, they're just sitting outside the library, and they're making Ebola jokes. So I just come out into the hallway and let them know, um, children have died. Families have been ravaged. Communities are in mourning. And you're laughing. And the whole hallway went silent. And I went back into the library. Um... But those sort of moments of just, I'm like, where I'm, where I'm at nowadays is not, um, like, really acknowledging these things with students and not making it part of the curriculum, but making it a part about our interactions as students and teachers. You need, they need to be able to understand what I'm, what I'm going through and how I, how I go through that as a human being because that's how they're going to be expected to be as human beings as they go out throughout as they go throughout the world. And they need to understand that people go through these things and be able to talk with them and have conversations about them. Um, so I'm really interested in destroying the idea of schools as a safe space. Can I say something to that? I, I think I we probably both agree. I think it's just so maybe terms we're using. Right. I think you can have a safe space and still be uncomfortable. Right. Because to me, discomfort doesn't mean that you're not safe. So when I think of safe space, I just mean, you know, there's some ground rules and ex expectations that we set as a group that this is how we're going to uh, deal with each other. This is how we're going to 
uh, function in this class and I actually tell students you will be uncomfortable we are going to um, talk about things that might make you cry I welcome your laughter I welcome your anger I welcome your tears we can handle it this this room can handle um, whatever you need to bring into the space so when I'm thinking about safe space I don't mean kumbaya circles and glossing mm -hmm. over things I certainly mean getting down to it but making sure that uh, students are you know kind of wrapped up at the end of it all so that they can go back out to their next class and not be so raw and so open. So just thinking about how do you scaffold those conversations right. in these 45 minute, you know, uh, sessions that you have um, and then k keep the momentum going. So that's what I mean when I say safe space. Yeah, that's good. I want to welcome Sam Reed, who um, had parent-teacher conferences maybe tonight, or yeah, I, I just get in from the parent conference, and kind of what motivated me to call in because I'm really tired. I'm watching the CNN uh, report of like you know what just went down um, in New York. So instead of watching the news, I kind of like let me hear, let me hear what other teachers are saying. So I'm not going to talk as much, guys. <laughs> well, and I just saw Sam last night on on a PBS segment about his work at his school so that was you're my hero <laughs> anyway jump in whenever you'd like Jane did you wanna what have you been thinking or do you wanna jump uh, in with any thoughts yeah I, I don't I don't know if I can articulate all my thoughts yet um, this feels um, like it's one second after Michael Brown and I haven't had a chance to regain my footing from that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very interested to hear about the different types of classrooms that, that all of you are working in. Um, working for the writing project, I don't have my own classroom anymore. I, I have the privilege of being in many classrooms across the city. Um, but I think all of this has brought me back to my own classroom in New York City where I taught for 10 years um, and all I learned from the kids I worked with. Um, so there's, there's my response as an educator and my history as a teacher um, and, I, and I don't know all of you but I'm also having a very powerful response as a mother. Um, it's taken me a long time to process um, the dre the death of Trayvon and understanding his, you know how his mother must have felt knowing literally blow by blow what happened to her child um, and so it, it, all of those emotions are kind of intertwined and so when you talk about a safe space, Christopher, I, I, that resonates with me very strongly because I feel like I don't know where that safe space is right now for any of us. And so I think about children at large in New York City. I think about my own children. And I'm struggling with how to talk to them about what a safe space might be. Um, and yeah, so tonight, you know, actually, when I saw on my Twitter feed um, that there was no indictment for Eric Garner, and I, I was hoping, I don't know if I believed there would be, but I was hoping, I wasn't hoping with Michael Brown, I knew. Um, so I think these are just profoundly difficult times. Um, so yeah. Um, what Jane was just saying kind of represents some of the stuff that's gone on in the chat room and some of the stuff that's gone on on the PT chat mm -hmm. uh, with um, Marsha Chat Lane. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so one of the things that's surfacing is that it's hard to talk about race in schools, and uh, you know, we already heard that from Janae tonight. Um, you know, like how do I talk about it? Um, you know, so how do I talk about race in schools? Um, I think one of the, the crucial things is is what Jane was just talking about is having our kids look at things from different perspectives to step outside themselves and think of, you know, you just talked about empathizing with the mother. 
And, you know, there are kids in my class who are the children of law enforcement, you know. There are kids in my class whose cousins are incarcerated, you know. So we have to honor all those different perspectives of things like that. And I think, to me, it's it's easier to talk about race if we if we take on different perspectives. You know, we look at this from as many different ways as we can. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that, Chris, but my, my pushback from that is that um, where, well, where is the space for this per, the perspective that they have already, or this perspective that they're getting from home, and when, do, and when is there a time to talk about that and not um, sort of talk about the many different ways, but talk about the way that they feel and, and having that feeling be an academic opportunity and not just uh, sort of like a moment to observe from a, like a, a disaffected or a um, sort of like distance, but to be up close and have that conversation. Now, this is me and my um, sort of like yearnings. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't say I know how to do that, but the, I, I, I don't like the, the, um, the stance of, having to talk about race in a way that is somehow, um, that's a step back from where we are now as, as people. And I feel like the administration always, uh, school administrations do that, and uh, we try to do that, but we never get back to like how we are interacting as people in the present moment. And um, for me, I guess, you know, because I've, I've really been, been trying to think how I want to introduce the idea of race and, and all these isms that I want to introduce in my classroom. Um, and I've, I've thought about that idea that you've, you've brought up, Chris, and um, not Chris Rogers, the other Chris, sorry. Um, Chris Sloan, yep, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's your last name? Sloan. Sloan, okay. Um, and, and my problem with, with well, not problem, um, but just trying to figure out how that would look in my classroom. Um, when we're talking about marginalized peoples and how they've been impacted um, in a classroom that is majority non-marginalized people, um, I just, I don't, I, I feel like the voice of, of my few students who are students of color would just get lost in there. Um, and, and maybe the one or two students of color who would be actually willing to, to speak their experiences would get completely drowned out by the lived experiences of my white students. Um, and I feel like that would be really counterproductive to what I'm trying to do. Um, and that would force me to bring in way more of myself than needs to be in the conversation. Um, about race, about racism, um, and I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, but that's, that's, those are my thoughts there, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to make sure that we create that space for the voices who have been marginalized and make sure they're not, like, re-marginalized by us having this conversation in a majority white classroom. You make a lot of sense, um, but it's good that this is on video, because, right? Because, like, I as a as a white teacher with mainly African American and Latino students have a different relationship than you with mainly white kids and as an African American woman, right? Um, so, like, our particularities uh, get played out a lot, and that's what that's what gets hard. Um, I think. I mean, I don't know. I don't know why it's hard, but we we like we, it's. It's hard to make any general rules about, you know, how to approach the subject because it depends on particularities of our schools. But I'm impressed again, even even with our brief introductions to each other, of how segregated our schools are. Mm -hmm. um, and there's got to be a way to use some of this to to break that down. Um, you know, to see each other's kids. If kids to see each other more. Like, I, I just, you know, I, I think my, my kids don't really even know what white kids think or do. 
<laughs> so if, if, yeah, if I, 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 I want to piggyback and hop in uh, because I'm teaching in a similar context with you, Paul. I'm at a predominantly uh, school of kids of color, but interestingly, we have a mix of uh, you know black and Latino kids. And so uh, we were talking about the Ferguson situation in my class, and it it pulled up some some tensions that I, I don't say I wasn't expecting, but it was it was, it was kind of jarring because one young lady, because one of my Latino male students. Because she spoke to him kind of rudely, and then he didn't listen to her. She kind of just went off on the kid, and she started using uh, in inappropriate racial, you know, uh, remarks against this kid. And so it made the class um, real deafening. And then I have one kid. Um, I don't know if he's anyway. He he's he's part Latino and part, I guess, part white. If if you that's how he describes himself and um, normally he's like actively engaged in normal and everyday uh, you know conversations in the class but during this discussion he was quiet and I wanted to hear his voice but then I didn't want to put him on the spot you know to call his voice out because I didn't know how you know how the class was going to interplay on that as well so it was it was really interesting but I think it was still valuable to have the conversation than to not have the conversation and then afterwards, I tried to fix up the situation with the young lady in terms of letting her know, um, you know, that she went out of line with some of her remarks that she made. And then also making sure that the young man who she made the remarks towards, you know, how he felt. Because, you know, at the youth school, we're trying this restorative practice. So, so instead of like, um, and looking at trauma, like this young lady who spoke out, you know, strongly against this young man, instead of like focusing on, like what's wrong with her, you know? I, we you, we focus on like, okay, what's been done to her? What's her story? And you know, why is she lashing out at this young man? And so, I, I think that's important that we look at um, uh, you know, the trauma that race and racism has, uh, you know, manifested in America, and not just with black folks, but with folks all in this whole country with our with this um this race up session that we got. So, Renee, can you talk a little more, you, you, when you talk about bringing art um, and, and the hope of art in some way um, in the classroom, um, so, so, and I'll be, I can be more specific, <laughs> referring back to your article a little bit, um, you, you, your article ends with your, your students writing poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and you get to see their voices there, but but I think there is other art that that you that you work with artists in the classroom as well. Right. Um, and and so, like, what is the role of art in all of that? And and then, yeah, go ahead. No, finish it. Finish it. Up. Well, I th then the other part of the article that I was curious about was like, um, and then the, the blog post that you wrote in August clarified this a little bit, but like. How the kids did the research, like how do you, how do you go? I think you called it earlier the root causes. How do you get them to look at the root causes? So I'm asking opposite questions here. <laughs> how do you get them to do the like the hard deep yeah. learning about root causes, but also make art, right? To right. So I guess oh, there's so much I'm thinking and wondering. Um, so I feel like art is a way to help young people exercise the muscle of empathy, right? So kind of, I think going back to what Chris was saying, you know, writing persona poems where you have to write in someone else's perspective is a way to get young people to just think about um, what someone else is feeling. And oftentimes they realize that they feel that too, right? Because that, that also is helping them realize that people are human and that, um, yeah, that loss is, is felt across the board of whites and blacks and Latinos and that it doesn't necessarily have to be an us against them kind of thing. So when I'm when I'm talking about um, Ferguson in the classroom, I haven't ever just come in the room and said today we're gonna talk about Ferguson. Like I, I haven't just had a blanket open discussion um, even when it was about Sean Bell or Trayvon Martin. Um, I usually bring in art as the springboard to help young people um, have a starting place. 
and because I think it's easier sometimes to talk about characters, right, or to talk about something else first before talking about how they feel. So um, bringing in these poems, that both of the poems that I've been using use actual facts. Like they are using some of the facts that actually happened in real life, but then also as writers taking the liberty to use their imagination. So we discuss the poem, and that's kind of how they begin to learn. If they didn't know these stories, they learn about Amadou Diallo. They learn about Henry Dumas, um, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant. These are the names that are mentioned in the poems. And then I give them articles. I'm like, okay, so now that who are these people? Let's look at the articles. And they have to read them and take notes on the articles, underline things that stand out to them. And then, you know, we're gradually kind of building a word bank for them to use some facts that, that they can hold on to that ground the piece because a lot of times they just know the hype of these moments and not the actual facts of what went down. And then I allow them to have some, you know, creative liberty and use their imagination to, they can speak from their own perspective on how they feel about it. They could speak from someone else's perspective. I mean, I've had students write poems from the perspective of the bullet from the perspective of the mom, um, Sean Bell's fiance. So it just the ground that the blood spilled on. So they go all wild with um, where they want to take it. And then we talk about how does this make you feel after they've created some art and processed it that way. Um, and in talking about how it makes you feel, I, I ask them to take action in a way that it makes sense for a 16-year-old or a 13-year-old. So even if it's just posting your poem on Facebook or sharing your poem with another teacher, how do you take this learning outside of the classroom and start to, um, you know, develop your artistic voice? So those are some of the, I guess, more practical things that I try to do in using art and articles and getting young people to, to respond. Does that answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> or the first I know. I'm, I'm glad I asked it. <laughs> That's great. You're, you, I, Can I say something else, too, about discussion? Yeah, please jump in. Yeah. I think um, when I, you know, I think structure, so I, I, I think this is something I struggle with. How much do I want to just let the young people talk and not have a lot of structure, right, and just let it be real and raw and I step back? And then what do I need to do to, you know, really provide... Um, like Janae was saying, though, I don't want students to leave feeling more wounded and more frustrated. So what's the balance of that? So just a few practical things. I'm sure a lot of you do, but I just want to reiterate, like, I can, I've had chart papers on the wall. If students come in, there's a prompt in the middle of the chart paper, and it could be maybe um, a picture, a photo of Mike Brown, or uh, when it was Trayvon Martin, you know, the a lot of photos were going around with him in the hoodie. Um, maybe a word that says violence or police brutality. And quietly, without talking, they get a marker. There's music playing in the background. And they're just responding to the chart paper. Um, and there's rules about it. You're not responding to what someone is saying. You're staying in your own space and just writing what you're thinking. And then after they return to their seats, we can now have a discussion that's a little more structured because words are on the wall. They've kind of got to get some things out without being on the spot just yet. And I can facilitate that by saying, okay, on this chart paper here um, about police brutality, we have fear, we have anger, we have frustration. So this is what we're thinking as a class. We're angry. And I talk in that term of we um, so that I'm not necessarily calling a student out. And I might say, does anyone want to add to what I'm saying or expound on what you wrote? So I think if you just think about um, structures of ways to have conversations in the classroom that provide young people who don't want to talk a lot an opportunity to get it out, and then the students who want to talk an opportunity to speak, I think thinking about those structures is important too, to not just come in and say, we're going to talk about Mike Brown, how do y'all feel, but to actually set up a space where they can have a structured conversation has been something um, important to me and something I've learned over the years of how to how to do. And um, something else from the chat room and um, actually Marsha Chatelaine is doing some um, chatting with PT chat tonight and um, you know one of the things she uh, said was you know use history texts about civil rights to demonstrate the qualities of change makers. Uh, 
and um, in the chat room, Alice Mercer mentioned that, like in her classes, she's teaching civil rights and abolition movement. Um, you know, to talk about how people have at least creatively tried to address some serious problems in the past, and and to teach the qualities of you know, like what ha what are change makers and how can we apply those things now. I think is also another uh, way to approach it. Yeah, absolutely. I think too using, you know, again, I'm always going to give a poetry reference, sorry, because that's what I teach, but yes, thinking about well, who are the poets who during the civil rights movement were writing about it? Um, what can I pull from um, Maya Angelou, Langston Hughes, like people who wrote about race and race relations in America, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Lucille Clifton, and using that as the springboard to have conversation and make connections again so that young people are realizing, oh, this is not new. This is something that has been going on. We've made some progress. We have a long way to go. Where are we on the spectrum? How do you as a young person want to leave a legacy like these writers did? So that's kind of the conversation and the angle I'm taking it in the classroom. Sam, do you want to talk about what you just posted there? You're muted still. Yeah, so actually, uh, uh, your, your 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 talk of uh, structure made me think about how I kind of tried to set up uh, the conversation. Um, I have the kids come in, and I'm using uh, the KQED do now, and they had some do nows around the um, police issues, and so I had kids writing and thinking and reflecting on it. But then I found this. In fact, I didn't find it. One of my students came in, Mr. Reed. Watch, look at this uh, video, and it's a video of a young man. Um, and it's called Criminals uh, with Permission. And he's uh, giving, the, you know, uh, it's rap lyrics talking about how police, the double standard. And it, it was really powerful. Kids were like dead silent and listening to it. Um, and so that kind of like grounded the, 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 the space for the conversation. And But again, the conversation still, you know, went its way. But um, I, I tried to, like you say, put those structures in to have have the conversation. Um, I shared it with with Chris and a, a, a bunch of um, some of some um, on our black male teacher meetup uh, group. And I don't know if uh, Chris had anything to say on it as well in, in terms of looking at it. Uh, Chris Rogers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going? Um, the thing I've been this has been like I don't know if it's backwards. It probably is. No, no, you got it. Okay. It's only backwards to you. But um, <laughs> SOS calling out black people, black arts movement reader, just came out in September. Uh, Sonia Sanchez is in Philly. They had an event, and it's awesome. Seven hundred pages of um, sort of like readers from that, that black art, black arts movement era. So when I talk about like destroying safe spaces, that's like a Mary Baraka one hundred and one <laughs> for me. Um, but um, I've, I've been pulling a, a, a lot of. Um, <laughs> Uh, stuff, especially for um, one of the articles, I talk about it in the uh, State of Immediate Urgency. This is an article from like the 70s. Um, David Lorenz, he says, um, it's like Eng English isn't relevant. And he, what he's trying to respond to is, is um, when, when a student might say, um, Eng English ain't relevant. And, he, and a lot of times you, you try to take it as like a surface remark. You say, well, these students should be doing their work. But he really grounds it in the experience of black people within America and how that other experience and not knowing what that is opens up a whole new way of looking at not just English but looking at life and um, I've been really like um, reflecting on that article and thinking of ways in which the content that we teach in the classroom like isn't 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 relevant in in the sense of is how are we speaking back to the issues that are at hand today? I think some of us talked about that earlier. And just trying to find those interesting ways to take mathematics objectives or social studies objectives or English language arts objectives and, and fit them in a um, sort of like tapestry that gets back at this, at this, at this point and asks this question of like, when are we going to be human again? And um, yeah, I mean, that's been the the big thing for me, and just looking at that from my space as a technology integrator, looking at that from the space of curating resources from the library, and just having that edge to it, where it's always leaving more students with questions than it is answers. 
So can I challenge you all um, to think about what makes the conversation difficult? And, then, and I, there was a, a plural in that conversation. Um, and I have one example. Um, when I see politicians on TV saying, you know, we don't want violence. Violence never leads to anything. We want peaceful protests. And then um, I'm an avid listener to uh, This Week in Black. Um, and um, and there, you know, they mention, you know, the Tea Party, the, you know, um, not the Tea Party, sorry. Uh, you know, and the revolution and, and like, you know, and, and the, the burning of the cities in the 60s, weren't, weren't there, there were some positive things that came out of that stuff. So so that that for me is a place of controversy. Like, does violence ever lead to good things? I mean, I got to, if you look at history, it does, you know? Um, so I think it does. So am I allowed to say that? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring up something that's difficult to say. The second example I'll give is: Is it okay for anybody in in your in our classes to say the indict? You know, not bringing an indictment was a good thing. Is that okay? Can can we still be teaching against racism and deal with those facts in some way? So, so my challenge is like: What are the issues that make these conversations hard? <laughs> so, if I may. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, when I have the conversation with my uh, students, and I'm, anyway, I'll go ahead. When I have the conversation with my students, um, I, I did it with two sections of one class that I have, um, which is the service learning class. Um, and in this class, well, in all my classes, but in this class particularly, um, first week of school, at the end of the week, we create by ourselves, as, as a class, uh, ground rules for engagement, essentially. What does a safe classroom look like? What is, it, what is a classroom where we can have difficult conversations and still come out all alive, all breathing, all ready for our next block? What does that look like? Um, so before we had our uh, a discussion, we reviewed those ground rules um, and make sure every, I made sure that everyone was on board. Um, I will say it took me a really, really long time to, to decide that I was going to have the conversation because I am the young black teacher in the school um, who is the advisor for the feminist club and the LGBTQ club. Like, <laughs> just a lot of things. Just a few um, things there. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just a lot of things that already have me on the radar um, <laughs> in, in a very conservative area of... of um, where I live. So I even, like, I ran it past my mentor, my first year mentor. I was like, no, you have to be in my classroom. I can go sit in your class while we have this discussion if need be, but I need somebody to, to be in there to say, this definitely went down in a very constructive manner. Like, all of these hurdles that I'm, that I'm like, I know I need to to have someone to verify that that mm -hmm. I was not indoctrinating anyone, like, and that's so, a very real fear of mine. But what, uh, today, what is the conversation that, that you're so having? So the conversation that we had, um, so the way that I set up our conversation about Ferguson, um, sorry, it was a conversation about Ferguson. Okay. Maybe I should have started there. Um, we had kind of a week where we talked about social media and social justice and uh, the the power of individuals as journalists, essentially, um, in 2014, via Twitter, via Snapchat, via all of in Instagram, all of these different modes of communication. Um, and the actual, we did a whole KWL chart, um, and huge thing backfired in one of my sec sections of this class. Um, we didn't have time at the end of the class to, um, after our KLW, to really discuss what our actual questions were. So, in me trying to like make sure I still had an opportunity to give them a chance to, to shoot off the questions that they had. Um, I used poll everywhere. Oh boy, did that backfire in my face. Um, so this gave the kids anonymity uh, and they just went to town. Some kids uh, said, uh, I don't have any questions. He deserved what he got. Um, speaking of Mike Brown, uh, 
he he deserved it. There were two two comments. He deserved it. And all the while, this is on my board. Like I'm wrapping up everything. This is popping up on the board. And I I didn't realize it until the bell had rung. I'm looking at the board and I'm like, oh, this is happening behind me uh, as I'm packing up. You know, getting class together at the end of the class. So, um, but the actual conversation um, was a, a G chat or a Google Hangout between my class and um, Sherelle Brown, who's a community or organizer for Equal Justice USA, which is an anti-death penalty um, organization. Um, and on her for, in her free time, she does um, police brutality work. Um, it's very close to her heart. So. She, in August, she went to Ferguson. Uh, she worked with folks on the ground, community organizing things uh, for about a week, week and a half, and then she went back in October. Um, so we had a conversation with her about her experiences, uh, and basically the, the, the entire conversation was driven by the students' questions. You know, I asked them to write down the questions and give them to me, and they did, um, but none of the questions that they actually wrote down were asked in the actual dialogue. Um, I, you know, once they she started talking about her experiences, it really drove their questions. So um, a lot of really great discussions and um, a lot of very interesting que questions were asked um, that showed me that we have a lot of a, a lot of space that we need to cover before we get to a place where we can have really in depth dialogue about privilege about all of these things that play into this this whole thing that, that Ferguson is and, and this Eric Gardner um, case, so. Can, can I sure. ask a quick question about um, how you do what you do in your classrooms around these topics? And that is, when you've all hinted at it a little bit, but how, how are you interacting with administrators mm -hmm. around these lessons and these kinds of conversations? That, um, I, I actually have found that to be difficult and challenging. How am I what, the administrator? How are you interacting with your AP, your principal, the administrators in your building? How How is that working or not? I know I can respond to that. So our school decided they were going to do a... Um, um, <laughs> around the time when... Um, Buildings start going on fire in Ferguson. Our our um our team decides they're going to make the next Monday's assembly about nonviolent protests and use Rosa Parks as an example because on December first, nineteen fifty five, is when she sat down on the bus. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that, there's some already, narratives there. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So already, I am like. I do not want to go to this assembly. I just want to just not be there. There's probably be a whole bunch of problematic things said. And, um, so I'm, I was um, I, I was there on Monday, and they have the conversation, and it's you know nice and sweet, and it wraps up everything in a nice little bow. You know, civil civil rights. They stood together. They fought together. Oh. And you know, eight weeks later, they got what they wanted non-violent and everything so sweet and peaceful so they did this presentation and um, I mean like me and my me and my principal have a, um, a good a good speaking relationship he knows the type of work and the type of questions that I'm always interested in so right after it's over um, I walk up to him and just say um, I didn't start with Ferguson first thing I said was do you know about Claudette Colvin you remember her story mm -hmm. you know she was like the black teenage pregnant woman that the NAACP wouldn't support uh, in the Montgomery bus protest. So then we start a conversation there, and then of course that leads back into Ferguson, because that was the uh, motivation for the assembly in the first place. <laughs> and then you talk about racial progress, and then the racial progress conversation leads into, you know, remember in 1994 when OJ got acquitted? <laughs> and that's when I was like, you know what, I'm done. I don't want to have this conversation with my administrators anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to my library and just hang out. And just that 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 burden of like those easy can can we just talk about this one topic and and be in that uncomfortable space together mm -hmm. and not just allow me to be there and you not want to join me. Mm -hmm. Right. That's my big thing with administrators. I right. can handle it with children because they're children. 
But with adults, it's like, y'all obviously don't want to have this conversation. Don't fake me into thinking you want to have it because that makes me feel even worse because now you're trying to, like, deny my reality. Hmm. Wow. Okay. I hope my <laughs> school doesn't watch this video. <laughs> 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 um, we should uh, be wrapping up, though. Um, yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, you have any uh, final thoughts for us tonight? Hmm. Hmm. Um, you know, I guess I'm thinking. I'm thinking two things. One, I'm hoping that educators that we move past just wanting to teach about Ferguson but that we get to a place where this is so common that our young people are expecting to have these conversations in their classrooms with us right. and outside of the classroom, right? That this is just, this is what we do. We talk about this world. We talk about it. We celebrate it. We critique it. We want to change it. Like that's the conversation always, regardless of what's in the news and what's not. Yeah, so they know when something happens, this is going to be, you're, yeah. this is, we're going to be talking about this, right? Yeah, a Absolutely, right. and how do you get that expectation from day one, you know, and, and carry it out through the year? Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is, it is it's work, it's hard, and, and it's not easy. And I think sometimes, you know, these answers that I have or the article can make it seem like, oh, you just do it, and it's just so easy, and the kids performed a poem, but no, you know, there are moments in this work and today was one of them where I was feeling very hopeless and very just like how do I how am mm. I going to go back again to the same yeah. students who've already written about this and now have another conversation so I think allies are important across uh, racial lines trying to find folks in your organizations and your schools to be an ally with and and like uh, Janae was saying self-care is important there are days where I just, I'm like, I can't, I need a break. I have to just decompress and reflect for myself. So I'm not bringing in all my pain and hurt into the classroom as an educator. So who do I go to to lean on? I think is is important and something we should all be thinking about as well. Um, I'm going to wrap this. Unless, Chris Sloan, you have any further connection here that you'd like to make here at the um. That was pretty eloquent ending right yes, there. it was. I agree. So um, thank you, um, everybody, for coming and sharing your experiences and, and thoughts here tonight. Um, I'm guessing that we're going to keep talking about this. One of the things that um, some people who looked at our lineup uh, have challenged us to think about is getting some youth voices on here some young people um, having some of their opinions up here as well so we're gonna I'm gonna kind of look to that later in the month so keep that in mind but um, we meet here every Wednesday night uh, this is called teachers teaching teachers and um, it's uh, a it's on the a channel of the world bridges network um, edtechtalk.com slash TTT is, is one place to find it um, I'm Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up um, and uh, built that community. So thank you all for joining us for this conversation, and we'll see you again soon. Good night. Thank you for having us. All right, guys. See you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.